Okay, I think we hit the eight o'clock mark central time, nine o'clock mark Eastern time. So we'll begin this morning, uh, Grand Rounds introduction. So our speaker this morning is, is Dr. Ellie Van Ellen from Harvard Medical School, Dana-Farber Cancer Institute and Broad Institute. Uh, Ellie obtained his bachelor's of science in uh, symbolic systems from Stanford University. I had to look up what that was. That's probably the coolest undergraduate title I've ever, I've ever seen. I thought it was something straight out of a Dan Brown novel, but it seems to be a lot uh, aligned with computer, computer science. Uh, he then obtained his MD degree at UCLA and was a resident in internal medicine at UCSF before moving to Harvard Medical School, Dana-Farber Cancer Institute to do his fellowship in hematology and oncology. Uh, in 2013, he joined the faculty at Harvard Medical School as an instructor and then was promoted to assistant professor in 2016. And I see from the, from the title slide that he has been promoted to associate professor. And that's probably very recent because it wasn't on the CV that you sent me. So congratulations. Oh, right. Thank you. Yes. Congratulations <laughs> on that. Uh, Ellie's an associate member in the cancer program at the Broad Institute. In from 2016 to 2019, he was computational director at Dana-Farber Cancer Institute, Center for Cancer Precision and Medicine. He's a member of the core faculty at the Center for Cancer Genomics at Dana-Farber. So, so Dr. Ellen, Dr. Van Allen is exceptionally well-funded physician scientist. Uh, CV listed 24 active projects investigating various aspects of genome biology, precision oncology, computational biology. For instance, he's PI on a NCI R37 Merit Award, PI on NCI R01, PI on NCI U01, PI on many other grants from many other agencies, including DOD, PCF. He's received numerous awards for his research. In 2015, he was named a Damon Runyon uh, Clinical Investigator and received their Clinical Investigator Award. Uh, he received the Medical Oncology Discovery Award from Dana-Farber. He received the Philip Sharp Collaboration Award from Stand Up to Cancer. And in 2019, he was elected to membership in the American Society for clinical investigation. So I'm really excited to hear what Ellie's going to tell us about today. Uh, his seminar titles, Clinical Computational Oncology for Precision Cancer Medicine. I'm going to mute and listen. Looking forward to it, Ellie. Thank you. So Scott, thank you so much for the extremely overly generous and kind introduction. Um, it's a privilege to virtually be here. Um, I wish I could say I was there in person and I hope one day to be there in person. Um, I hope all are well or as well as can be expected in what has been quite a year, um, and then some, um, and just feel like it's just to acknowledge that up front. So as you heard again, I'm Ellie, I'm a medical oncologist at Dana-Farber, and I run a computational biology lab at Dana-Farber on the Broad, um, just by way of introduction. So here's my lab website. You can follow along with me on Twitter, or you'll hear me complain about our electronic health record. Um, for today's talk, I actually wanted to sort of use this as a pitch to talk about something called clinical computational oncology, which is sort of a field I made up for myself and um, sort of introduce that to this audience um, and you know, would love feedback and thoughts as we move along. Um, but first, as always, I like to <clears throat> put my disclosure slide. Um, and I use this not just because it's the right thing to do, but also to call attention uh, to the last disclosure slide and for this further introduction uh, for an equity. I, I am a shareholder in Microsoft um, I received uh, five shares of Microsoft stock for my bar mitzvah in 1993. Um, there's a picture of me with a really impressive head of hair that I no longer have. Um, as you heard, so I studied something called symbolic systems, which is a mix of computer science with philosophy and linguistics uh, at Stanford. And like many people in Silicon Valley at that time, and even now, I sort of had a pretty clear career trajectory. Uh, my plan was to go work in uh, tech. Um, like all of my friends uh, who went on to work and or found some companies that you've probably heard of before. Um, and actually a funny thing happened along the way. Uh, while I was an undergrad, some friends of mine were help starting a camp for kids whose parents have or had cancer. And that seemed like a kind of a fun thing to do, at least to try. And so I, I helped them create the first uh, thing, called, the first Camp Kesson, uh, which is for kids whose parents have or had cancer. And I decided to see that through all the way to the end. And for me, this was just a life-changing experience. Um, and sort of this humanistic uh, thing, working with uh, cancer patients, working with their families, uh, is why I actually went into medicine specifically and into cancer medicine. Um, and it's actually pretty cool. We had our 20, virtual 20 year anniversary. There's now over a hundred camps across the country. Um, and it's just pretty exciting to sort of like see how that's grown. And that's for me why I ended up in medicine. Um, the, the challenge though, was that I ended up in medicine as somebody who was basically a computer nerd. And this was all a bit of an accident. 
Uh, and so what I've tried to do is actually try to blend all of my different sort of areas of interest together into one thing uh, that I call clinical computational oncology. So again, I am a clinician. I see patients every Monday morning over at Dana-Farber uh, in the GU cancer group. I'm a computer nerd at heart. Uh, and uh, while I write grants, mostly as you heard, I still, I do like to write code when I can. Um, and I like to blend this into sort of the translational biology world of cancer and really in genital urinary cancers as I'm able. And so that sweet spot in the middle where I get to actually study my own patients, um, I get to apply algorithms to all the data I'm generating from my patients and blend it into the sort of the cancer omic biology world is this sweet spot uh, that I'm personally interested in. And luckily for me, um, <clears throat> while I was cultivating this interest in the early part of the prior decade, I wasn't doing this in a vacuum. I had a sort of a chance encounter with my then well, ended up being mentor, Levi Garraway, who was wanted to tell me about something called precision cancer medicine, which was sort of, a, sort of in, I'd say in the nascent phases back in the early 2010s, um, and which I'll summarize here, but this is something that like he was pretty excited about and he got me excited about it too. And just to sort of really simplify it for, uh, oversimplify it for this uh, advanced audience, but just sort of lay the groundwork, I'll just, briefly define what I mean. Um, precision medicine being you have an advanced cancer, we test you for some tumor specific genetic targets we can drug that keeps getting longer and longer. We perform a clinical action that keeps getting longer and longer. And he said, you know, gosh, there might be something interesting for someone like you in this space. And I, and I said, why? And then he actually explained, well, we think there's going to be some data for people like you to crunch on. And it turned out that was actually pretty, a pretty, pretty, uh, correct as well. And so the way I like to articulate that part of this background is with this slide. And I think folks have probably seen a version of this graph a million times over. Um, gosh, it's getting super cheap to, to sequence genomes and that's great. But the reason I actually like to use this slide is to actually do the following, which is to add another axis to this plot. Data points per patient, how much data can I conceivably generate for my own patients at the point of care that I need to keep in my brain as a physician? that I would need to actually make a clinical decision. And I can actually map my medical training onto this plot. So I started med school in 2003 and really all the way through the end of residency in 2010, I learned that it, you know, many aspects of medical care are not that complicated, which I don't like to broadcast too loudly, but I feel like I'm in a safe space here. Uh, and so I keep it real with you guys. Um, you keep some history and physical information, some lab tests and imaging result, what on your brain, and you can sort of figure out what to do for the vast majority of patients without trying too hard. Um, so I, I moved to Boston in the early 2010s and around that time they were rolling out these hotspot genotyping assays at the point of care. So in the fellow workroom, we were receiving these reports that had just lists of mutations and lists of genes and a yes or a no. And we had no context or background or any idea what we were looking at. And we were given no training or forewarning even. And we were just started getting these things and we were expected to act on them, which was kind of complicated, um, but not super overwhelming. And of course, you know, now it is you know, somewhat trivial to imagine generating exomes and genomes and transcriptomes and whatever ohms off of patients at one time point, at multiple time points. And clinically, this creates a whole series of challenges, but also of research opportunities. And so for what clinical and uncomputa computational oncology is trying to do is tackle those opportunities or tackle those challenges, you know, sort of in mass to really achieve the ultimate vision of a precision cancer medicine as we all are aspiring to do. And so the way I like to actually frame that is around three central questions that we like to ask in, in, in this domain. Um, the first question starts with one patient and one point in time. And can we use molecular profiling at the point of care to guide an individualized treatment in oncology. And you know, in essence, that really comes down to, can we come up with algorithms that prioritize amongst a whole sea of data from any patient, what we should do for that patient? Sort of clinical interpretation of the cancer genome, which is you know, not a new challenge. And in fact, that was actually the challenge that Levi had posed to me on my first day as a postdoc in his lab. And he said, in essence, hey, Ellie, we're about to generate a bunch of prospective whole exomes from our cancer patients. We need to figure out a way to you know, take all this data and prior find the actionable mutations. It, what do you think? And so I basically went into a hole for about a year and a half and I came out 
with this algorithm, um, precision heuristics for interpreting the alteration landscape and method called file. It has a very cheeky uh, Lord of the Rings obscure reference if anyone is interested. Um, this was a heuristic algorithm. Basically, it had a ranked list. It would rank mutations by actionability. Um, I also made a database um, that was associated with this algorithm for actionable alterations. And you put those two things together. And we were actually delivering precision medicine at the point of care. We were using, doing clinical whole exomes from our cancer patients, running this algorithm, reporting the results to physicians. Um, and obviously, we were not the only ones doing this. Um, there's a lot of wonderful groups and activities and uh, efforts happening. And um, all of this was really exciting. And, you know, here, I wish I could tell you then that, you know, we therefore solved precision cancer medicine and piece of cake. And we all sort of, you know, had a, had a party and everything was easy and great. Um, however, as I think we all know over the, core, over the arc of the rest of the prior decade, um, the, the early returns on this concept were not that great. Um, so here is one example of a precision cancer medicine study that couldn't possibly be more negative uh, of, you know, ran, get patients getting, you know, molecularly targeted agents or the treatment of the, by the physician's choice. Um, this was another study uh, where actually, so they, they tried, um, but, you know, actually the most sobering part of this challenge was that only 7% of the successfully screened patients benefited from this approach. And it turned out, which you know, perhaps we were naive at the time, but, you know, or, or perhaps over, overly optimistic, that there was many challenges to actually delivering on this concept of precision cancer medicine. Um, and some of those challenges uh, still remain, but we think are readily tackleable, uh, tackleable with um, computational oncology approaches. So one of the challenges was that technology in the clinic is evolving. Um, when I start, I mentioned earlier, we were starting to get these hotspot genotyping assays in the clinic. Um, and that was already pretty hard based off of somatic DNA-based mutation data. Um, we now get DNA tumor and germline. We get bulk RNA sequencing. Um, we, we kind of imagine that we pretty soon can get all these data sets, single cell profiling, immune assays and whatnot, all from an individual patient at the point of care. And so the technology and data complexity is growing significantly. And our ability to interpret that information um, has still not been solved algorithmically. In addition, knowledge keeps evolving. And this is actually something that we, I started to realize in real time and we couldn't even keep up with it. So what I mean is, is that we, that I, we, made, we spent all this time to make an actionability database. Um, and we worked really hard and we curated all the knowledge in the universe. We asked all, asked all the famous experts and we made this great thing. We actually went back and revisited that same database a couple of years later and found out that almost half of the content in that database was no longer correct and that the things that we thought were going to be actionable turned out not to pan out in, in subsequent trials. Alternatively, things that we thought were definitely not actionable turned out to then be actionable uh, in clinical trials or other kinds of contexts or other preclinical systems. And we were just wrong and couldn't possibly even keep up with it. And the third problem was that you know, clinicians needed help. We were delivering this content to people who had no prior training in any of these technologies and expecting them to just instantly just absorb it and um, to absorb it in a way that they can make effective clinical decisions. And so for that, it's sort of here is like a screenshot of one of the clinical reports that were delivered to patients over at Dana-Farber, or rather to physicians. Um, and, and you don't need, there's no, there's no fine print that's intended to be read, but just to point out that it's, it's unintelligible to anyone anyway, so it doesn't really matter. And I think that it became, you know, too hard. So can we help? Um, can we help with this pro the sort of the initial problem? How do we interpret a cancer genome one patient at one point in time? And so the good news is, is that we actually think this is a really fun problem to solve. And so we can actually make better algorithms to tackle a lot of these challenges. So for example, um, the data complexity as a result of the technology is advancing quickly and the need to understand not just sort of singleton mutations, but mutations related to each other, related to mutational signatures, related to immune infiltration patterns matters for clinical decision-making. Uh, everything from, you know, PARP inhibition and prostate cancer and immune checkpoint blockade and kidney cancer and so on and so forth. And so we've actually now developed algorithms that can annotate and evaluate these first order genetic events like BRAF, B600E, and these second order relationships like germline BRCA mutation and somatic uh, um, homologous recombination mutational signature 
you know, connected together relates to PARP inhibition. And we can capture these relationships in, in sort of, you know, in silico uh, and do this systematically. And to prove that we actually could do a better job, we went, revisited some of our prior data sets of melanoma and prostate cancer using our old algorithm and some of the newer, the, our newer approaches, which we've re, now that Levi doesn't work at Dana-Farber anymore, I'm not beholden to his Lord of the Rings obscure um, uh, references. And so just called it something simpler, a molecular oncology almanac. Um, and so we actually can fill in the gaps of a lot of things that were missed by our prior approaches and find the actionable events in a much more complicated representation of a patient's cancer genomics than we were able to do a few years ago. So finding it is good. Um, so we can make better algorithms for that. Um, can we make better algorithms to actually solve the knowledge base problem? And so here actually I'd say first, that a lot of groups have been thinking about this in the subsequent few years since we and others realized that our actionability databases were out of date. Um, and so, you know, they're actually focusing on curating and annotating a lot of these sort of FDA approved high level of evidence events. And so we actually took an opposite approach and said, wouldn't it be more interesting given that we're doing you know, exomes and genomes and transcriptomes in the clinic now to actually dig deeper into sort of the other direction to try to find stuff that might be a little bit more out there in a preclinical domain that might expand concepts of actionability in sort of end of one trial like settings. Um, and to do this, we actually developed an, a sort of a natural language processing uh, troll bot of PubMed to scrape information and try to find actionable events. We also did the, uh, so, and then build those into our knowledge base. We also tried to do some crowdsourcing experiments. So actually it turned out that the people that we wanted to crowdsource things didn't, are, are experts who don't have time to help us for free. Uh, and so that's not a surprise. And so what we did instead was try to make it as simple as humanly possible. And this thing actually exists in case anyone wants to use it. We made a little Chrome app. Um, so that you can just, you know, install it in your Chrome. Um, and if you see an interesting paper and you want to tell us about it, you just click the button and then just it pushes it to us and you don't have to do anything um, because we don't want people to um, spend all their time curating on our behalf and they won't anyways. Um, and so we've already had eight uh, five-star reviews that are definitely not eight people from our lab uh, who've done this. So you should go check that out. Um, and in so doing, by the way, I should add, we actually revisited our prior database and have revamped the entire concept of it. And it turned out that, again, a lot of things were wrong, but a lot of new actionable things were now present and could really, again, expand our scope of what it means to be, to, be, to have an actionable cancer genome. Um, and the third part is, is we actually thought about that sort of last mile problem, the sort of user interface user experience aspect of precision cancer medicine. Um, and to do this, we actually did a, a randomized survey study of our Dana-Farber oncologists to get, we had three fake patients and these physicians were randomized to receive our existing report or a new report that used some very basic web-based user interface principles, the kind of stuff that you would see like in Google app or really any, any way you interact with technology outside of healthcare that are sort of like given. And we asked the question of whether simply representing the information in a cleaner and simpler way would help physicians make the right choices for these patients. And then the results were kind of mixed. Um, in some cases, we actually were able to help, help physicians understand concepts like tumor purity or sequencing quality and how those can impact uh, a cancer genomics report. Um, strangely, uh, some of the things like, did they pick the right treatment, uh, didn't actually get affected by this. Um, and I think it spoke to the broader challenge of there being just continual need for education um, of physicians who are at the point of care delivering on precision cancer medicine and the, the corresponding molecular pathologists to really work together um, to sort of inform how we report this information because it's just so complicated. So putting this all together, um, so we revamped the method. We call it Molecular Oncology Almanac. Um, it's, it's sort of, this is all spearheaded by Brendan Reardon, his picture below. Uh, we have a website. There's a preprint. Our paper's in rejection uh, somewhere uh, one of these days, but you can check out the preprint if you'd like. Um, and the idea is we, we now take consider all DNA-based features in the tumor, DNA-based features in the germline, RNA-based features, um, uh, both mutations and fusions. Um, we consider them separately. We also consider them together, again, sort of in this sort of second order way and how they relate to each other. Um, I don't have time to talk about it today, but we also have a whole process in there for patient to model system matchmaking uh, to try to really expand concepts of actionability outside of humans and into model systems and seeing how we can find 
new, you know, things that, whether or not there's an alteration relevant, whether things that kill cell lines could then since conceivably be reported into a patient report. And we generate a very simple report uh, that sort of uses some of these basic UI principles that I described earlier. Um, we have both a knowledge base in this website. And I think the most fun part is actually we have a portal built on top of the sort of the um, cloud-based pipeline system for all the analytics uh, that anyone could actually set up with their own Google account, upload their own data, run the method themselves. Um, and get their own report. We never actually touch it or see it ourselves for obvious reasons. We don't want to get involved in that into that relationship. But I'm really trying to make this as open access as humanly possible. I would invite folks to check it out. Uh, we're still trying to figure out how to clinically study something like this. Um, it's sort of like decision support or whatnot. But um, in any case, open to any ideas, and would you know happy to talk about this further. So all of this though was about one patient at one point in time in the setting of precision cancer medicine. And I think we all know uh, that that is good and there's a lot of fun stuff to talk about there. Um, but even when we make a good treatment decision for this one patient at this one point in time, um, that patient almost invariably, if they're a metastatic cancer patient, becomes resistant to the drugs we give it. Um, that resistance can come quickly. Uh, that resistance can come after a very prolonged period of response. Um, every once in a while, you get these sort of you know unicorn uh, exceptional responder cases that never become resistant. And if the first question for computational oncology really centers about one patient at one point in time, um, the second question is more about studying cohorts of patients over time and asking whether these integrated molecular techniques with computational algorithms can inform resistance patterns that might reveal new biology, new targets, new biomarkers for all of the drugs that we give in oncology. I had a chance actually to start this, thinking about this with Levi as a postdoc, uh, looking at BRAF inhibitor resistance and, and uh, metastatic melanoma, um, but, and then sort of took that concept into the domains that I care about. And so I just want to follow with a few brief vignettes about sort of how we've used this and how we're continuing to use this. So one example um, is actually looking at serial biopsies before and after enzalutamide exposure in advanced prostate cancer. This is a study led by Celine Hahn and Justin Wong, who's I shamelessly uh, promote, who's a new faculty member uh, at your fine institution, who I was just chatting with on a sidebar in Zoom about five minutes before it uh, started. He's a, he's a wonderful, extraordinary human being. Um, and here, we generated whole exome sequencing from our patients and can die and use some evolutionary algorithms to look for changes over time. Um, and indeed, one of the most interesting things that we found in this N of one um, was, this is a zoomed in copy number data, focal amplification of CBK6 at the time of resistance in an RB wild type prostate cancer resistant to enzalutamide connected with Justin and Bill Hahn's lab, um, who did some experiments and not, perhaps no surprise in retrospect, but it's a, a pleasant surprise at the time, um, found that not only did this confer resistance to enzalutamide, it could be overcome with combinations using CDK4-6 inhibitors, um, which immediately led, you know, sort of like informed uh, uh, some of the combination clinical trials that are now ongoing, um, it, it precisely using a relatively small number of patients where we had pre and post uh, biopsies really good phenotypic information about response and um, analytics to dissect the molecular data. This is using bulk sequencing. Um, I should sort of shamelessly plug um, uh, a sort of a concept of now taking single cell profiling to capture not just the tumor cells, but also the surrounding immune microenvironmental cells in metastatic prostate cancer, bone mets, liver mets, um, lymph node soft tissue mets. Um, and this is sort of one part of a much larger study being led by Meng Xiao. He is a graduate student in my lab. Um, also, there's a, there's a version of it that's a little bit out of date, but the preprint of family wants to check it out. Um, and I'll just say, there's a lot going on in that study, but looking at serial biopsies over time and some algorithms to consider some of the nuance around single cell data sets and the challenges of sort of over-interpretation from any one patient, we actually went back and asked a bunch of questions about which transcriptional programs, so not DNA-based events, but rather RNA-based events, um, were actually operants in resist enzalutamide resistant settings and really honed in on, you know, TGF beta in particular as a very interesting program that was, you know, probably the most pronounced signal that we saw in this data set. Um, and so more to come there um, in a bit. So 
that was um, pre and post androgen therapy. Um, what about pre and post chemotherapy? Um, so we've actually done stuff. I'm actually, I think I even excluded this in the interest of time, excluded the whole uh, germ cell tumor angle of this, but I'm happy to come back to that another time. Um, but we looked at this in, in bladder cancer where patients will get neoadjuvant platinum based chemotherapy uh, in or muscle invasive bladder cancer, then go for surgery. Um, we had previously discovered um, a molecular mechanism of exceptional response to chemotherapy um, in this context, but we also wanted to look at what happens to the patients who don't respond. And so in this context, you have a pretreatment biopsy, you have, let's say three to four cycles of platinum-based chemotherapy, and then you have a resistant surgical specimen. Uh, we, at this point, this is led by David Liu, who's pictured on the right. Um, we did whole exome sequencing before and after. We applied some uh, cancer evolution analyses to uh, these data. Um, and at first we saw a whole lot of nothing um, no changes to anything whatsoever, pre and post, numbers of, uh, numbers of mutation, mutational burden, all this stuff, nothing. And that was a bit disappointing and took a lot of uh, sort of thinking. Um, but at some point towards the end of our journey here, we decided to look at mutational signatures. So again, another example where these sort of more complex global like second order molecular features might actually matter even when you can't find a single you know, mutation in, in the patient that, that's the real sort of key thing. And we noticed something interesting when we did our mutational signature analysis. Uh, in the pretreatment tumors, we found nucleotide excision repair in APOBEC, along with you know, signature one, which is, uh, which is present in every, in every specimen. Um, in the resistant tumor, we found those two signatures again. Um, and we also found this unknown signature that we could not attribute to anything. But we knew um, that there was an experimentally derived um, platinum mutagenesis signature from some chicken fibroblast lines. And so we converted the chicken genome to a human genome. And then we compared the mutational patterns in the sort of chicken cell derived signature and ours, and indeed found a rather strong correlation between our unknown signature and a platinum mutagenesis signature. And this has got really interesting when we then saw that we weren't alone in seeing this. So this was our signature. And this is some of the signatures recently reported from Peacock and Nature last year um, that actually look quite similar to ours. And the key thing here is that those signatures are directly attributed to tumors that have been exposed to platinum mutagenesis. And so we had using pre and post uh, exposure tumor specimens and time and clinical sort of context, we're able to discover a platinum mutagenesis signature that we're now trying to make sense of what it actually means. Um, because there's a lot of open questions about what this actually means for subsequent tumors who have been exposed to these kinds of chemotherapies, whether these, uh, these chemotherapies really shape some of the mutagenic processes that actually matter um, for the biology and a lot of other things that we just, we just don't know. Um, but we're really excited having stumbled into this to, to dig further. Uh, going forward. So we talked about androgen-based sort of targeted therapies, chemotherapies. Uh, what about immunotherapies? Um, can you use the same paradigm of pretreatment and resistant tumors uh, with molecular analysis and computational biology to make sort of inference and biological discovery? And so here's an example of an N of one. Uh, this is a patient with a metastatic leiomyosarcoma as part that was part of a sort of catch-all phase one trial. Uh, I believe this is the only sarcoma that responded to checkpoint blockade and had a really dramatic response. Um, so you can see sort of the, and sort of this liver mass shrunk to almost nothing. Um, this one lesion, however, kept growing in the pelvis. And so about 18 months after starting therapy, the patient went underwent a metastatectomy to remove um, this lesion. Um, they actually removed this lesion as well, which ended up being um, uh, just fibrotic. There was no tumor there. It's pretty cool. Um, and then we could actually perform, um, again, tumor evolution analysis, pretreatment and resistant tumors contextualized by therapy with a really dramatic phenotypic response. Um, and here we actually can do something even more interesting than we usually do uh, in these kinds of analyses. So what that I mean specifically, what we usually do is we take any patient's data and we plot on the x-axis the mutational abundance in the pretreatment tumor, the y-axis is the mutational abundance in the resistant tumor. Um, anything that's up here in this plot is a clonal mutation in the pre and the post. Anything up here is not detected in the pretreatment tumor and is detected in the resistant tumor. Um, those are sort of things that you want to look for as potential, not, as candidates for genomic resistant mutations. Um, well, for immunotherapy, it sort of also begs the question of, well, what about what's happening down here? 
Are there any mutations detected in the pretreatment tumor that are not detectable in the resistant tumor? And do those mutations, even if they're not you know, oncogenic or functionally relevant, do they create immunogenic neoantigens that the tumor is, that is being selected to downregulate or to not have those present? Um, and is that a way to actually find uh, immunogenic neoantigens um, in, in, in cancer patients, which is sort of a big open challenge? And so we, have, we applied our approaches to this patient's data. Um, and this was led by Diana Miao, pictured uh, on the bottom right. Um, and we found that uh, first, the only somatic mutation in the resistant tumor uh, was a, a, the second hit in P10, uh, which is pretty interesting, um, although in and of itself not definitive. We'll actually, I was asking you to bookmark that observation because we're gonna come back to that curiosity in a bit. Um, but we also, again, had the chance to think about what was happening on the bottom right of this plot. And this patient who was alive and well was very happy to come back and give us some of her blood uh, so we can get some T cells. Uh, we then took her tumor genomic data, did in silico neoantigen prediction. We then generated the peptides that we were predicting with, in collaboration with Kwok Wong when he was still at Dana-Farber. And then we were able to do some studies mixing her T cells with these peptides and go from a space of hundreds of candidate, in silico predicted candidate neoantigens down to really only two that were you know, in the mutant setting, creating peptides that provoked a T cell response that were not detected in the resistant tumor, but were detectable in their very immunoresponsive pretreatment tumor. And so this is sort of a different way of thinking about how to find neoantigens that matter in, in patients, uh, which is still a very big open challenge and one that we were pretty excited about expanding upon going forward. And so that's to be continued. So um, we started with one patient at one point in time. We then moved to following cohorts of patients over time. The third question is actually taking much larger sets of data from patients, often at one time point, and then splitting them into groups to ask some big picture questions like responders and non-responders. I'd say that's sort of the most common one that we had been done previously. Um, I would just you know point out that that's not the only way to ask this kind of a question. And especially as things get to some of the machine learning work that we and others are doing going forward, the opportunities here, I think are endless. And the data sets are now actually large enough to actually do this in mass. But in essence, can computational oncology enable discovery of mechanisms of response to cancer therapies using large patient data sets? And so for this part of this presentation, I actually thought I would stick to the immunotherapy um, angle, which is oftentimes the thing that, you know, people get most interested in these days. Um, so I'm happy to, and, and I'm also happy to take off on tangents after I'm done presenting to talk about some of the other work as well, but um, I'll stick to immunotherapy for now. And I'll start by where we in the field were at in this domain as of roughly 2015. And so right around then, um, our group and another group had reported on sort of a curious observation around CTLA-4 blockade and melanoma, whereby um, we saw that more mutations seem to correlate with response to immune checkpoint blockade in that setting. Um, the group in, in, in New York also made a similar observation of PD-1 blockade and non-small cell lung cancer. Um, and a group at Hopkins reported on PD-1 blockade and MSI high tumors with response. Um, and again, the sort of the constant theme here was tumor mutational burden. Um, was a feature, so the number of mutations, uh, which therefore, you know, in principle meant the number of immunogenic new antigens from those mutations were higher in immune checkpoint blockade responders compared to non-responders. Um, and so, you know, I think in, in our version of this, in our analysis, we were trying to take a pretty measured approach to sort of how we thought about this, because here's, here's, here's the reality, and we'll sort of just pick on our own data here, uh, which is, you know, this is our data from 2015. There was certainly a, a statistically significant correlation. So we were looking. So we were looking at our own data and TMB, um, and you know there was a statistically significant correlation between response and um, TMB. Um, however, you know you can certainly just looking at this data say, well, gosh, there's an awful lot of high mutation load non-responders and low mutation load responders. And are we sure this is actually solving our problems here as a biomarker or even getting at the biology? Um, we actually, when we looked at this in a much larger data set, um, which I'll come back to in a bit, um, the AUC of TMB alone was 0.66, which if you didn't know this was TMB, you wouldn't necessarily be used to running, you know, 
running wild saying this is the biomarker to solve immune checkpoint blockade. Um, and, you know, I will say I've sort of found this to be a, a rather curious journey over the last few years in this domain. And just to make this even harder, um, if we were in 2015 um, thinking about uh, TMB and sort of that was the one sort of molecular feature that folks are really thinking about uh, in, with respect to immune checkpoint blockade. Um, courtesy of sort of some uh, hard work by Tanya Keenan, pictured on the bottom right here is a fellow in my lab uh, who tried to curate um, what are all the other things that have been a, a, a attributed to contributing to response and or resistance to immune checkpoint blockade between then and now. Um, that list has gotten really long. And the other real kind of funny bummer about this, this particular table that we that we worked really hard to create that was, I think, published, I want to say, in like March of 2019. And I'm pretty sure by April of 2019, it was already out of date. And there was probably another like 10 plus rows of things uh, that have been invoked, which is to say this is an extremely hard problem. And to really emphasize why this is a hard problem and sort of to weave in and out of some of the biology and the biomarker space in this domain, rather than sort of picking anyone else, um, I'll just pick on myself and sort of describe a, a sort of a set of investigations that we're still trying to scratch our head on, but to really emphasize how complicated uh, this, this set of questions really is. Um, and thinking, and especially in departure, just where, I think where I mentioned earlier, where I started looking at like, you know, BRAF mutant melanoma and RAF inhibitors uh, as a relatively simple mental model for how things work. Um, this is the opposite of that. And so, to dive into this, I'll, I'll talk, tell a quick story about some of the uh, chromatin mutation patterns and immune checkpoint blockade response work we've been doing. And so for this, we actually were looking at this question in clear cell renal cell carcinoma. And the reason why we were so curious was that we already knew from the Cancer Genome Atlas work in, in kidney cancer, that there's really no such thing as high TMB kidney cancer. And yet their clinical response um, patterns were almost identical to you know, melanoma and lung cancer and bladder cancer in terms of clinical outcomes. So there must have been something else explaining what was going on here. And we wanted to look into why. And so to do that, we started with a very modest data set um, from, from Checkmate 009. This was a study led by Diana, who I mentioned earlier, and Claire Margolis, who formerly was a, a computational biologist in my lab. Um, and this is the clinical stratification of our patients. As you'll see, there's not exactly overwhelming sample size in this initial foray. Um, and so the first thing we did was look at TMB and all sorts of different ways of thinking about TMB, clonal mutations, indel load, all these other things. And it was basically a whole lot of nothing. We couldn't find any pattern here whatsoever. And so the next thing we did was actually take the known kidney, uh, significantly mutated genes in kidney cancer and ask whether any of those stratified by response. And to our surprise, um, really there was one thing that came up. So loss of function mutations in a gene called PBRM1 were associated with response to immune checkpoint blockade um, in kidney cancer in this data set. Um, anyway, we looked at it, um, there was a response pattern. The most interesting sort of like subtext of this though that we actually reported at the time was that the signal um, tended to come from patients who had already been exposed to VEGF TKIs for some reason and were not really as evident in patients who were in the first line, which is to say that the clinical context in which we were asking this question was paramount. And it was a subtle difference, but even that alone was enough to drive some of the signal. So I'll bookmark that as well, because we're going to come back to that in a bit. So um, what is PBRM1? Um, so it's a member of the chromatin regulatory SWISNF complex of genes. Um, so there's actually a complicated complex. This uh, is a simplified cartoon. Uh, Sigal Kadosh is a friend of mine and uh, whose whole uh, academic lab focus focuses on this complex. I believe it's found a third one. So there's actually, I should update this slide. There's a whole other cartoon. Um, but the reason I show this cartoon is more because uh, PBRM1 is specifically around the PBAF subcomplex uh, of uh, this chromatin regulatory pathway or a regulatory thing. Um, so there it is right there. Um, and there's only other, actually two other genes that are only members of the PBAF subcomplex. So they're not members of, they don't form any other um, complexes in this chromatin regulatory um, uh, experience. So there's PBRM1, um, does it mean anything? And so here I sort of learned a good junior faculty PI lesson. Um, we actually had gotten the study up to this point um, and didn't have much else and decided bravely perhaps or stupidly um, to go in front of the Broad Cancer Program, which is a pretty aggressive group of, of, of researchers and share what we had. And a few actually wonderful things came out of that. 
One was Bill Kalin um, reached out and said, hey, you know, we've got some PBRM1 um, isogenic cell lines, knock out, knock in, um, and we have transcriptional data on them. Would that be of interest to you? And we said, oh, yes, that's great. And it, so when we actually did um, uh, uh, transcriptional analysis, gene center enrichment analysis, looking for um, differences between the knockout and the, wild, and the wild type. And indeed, not only was there a general immune signaling pathway um, enrichment in the um, PBAF null cells, um, it specifically honed in on cytokines, uh, which we thought was pretty neat. Um, so that was nice. Uh, the second thing was actually I got an email um, from somebody in Kai Wolperfitting's lab who said, you know, you should really talk to Kai because Kai is doing some uh, CRISPR screens looking for T-cell mediated um, uh, cytotoxicity mediators in the screens um, of melanoma cells. And so I met with Kai and it turned out um, that uh, this was the results of their screen. So here's some of the, the gene hits that came up in a screen um, that's for set things that when knocked out, sensitized to immune checkpoint blockade. Um, I'll call your attention to these three red dots. Um, and those are PBRM1 along with ARID2 and BRD7, which by the way are the other two genes that are only members of the PBAF subcomplex. And the third email I got was from David Barbie, who's an old friend of the lab, who said, hey, you know, we're doing this work looking at um, genes that when lost um, result in overexpression of endogenous retroviruses, which are known to be immunogenic. And two of our strongest hits are PBRM1 and ARID2. And said, oh, well, that's pretty neat. Um, there's probably some real biology here because we come back to this cartoon and now we can talk about our friend PBRM1 along with BRD7 and ARID2. Um, so that was great. And that was really, really exciting um, uh, on, a, on a pure biological investigation perspective. Um, was there any other data in the clinic that this might actually be a thing? So we actually, in our initial study, had kludged together as much omics and outcomes data as we could find from the sort of friends and family, so to speak. Um, and indeed, we're able to replicate our finding. And again, our data sets were almost exclusively in second end line monotherapy treated patients. Um, Similarly, uh, we actually then went back into our larger Dana-Farber data set and were able to see a similar pattern. Um, we actually took a data set from Memorial Sloan Kettering and then matched their analysis, our initial analysis in those data set and validated it again. Um, but perhaps the most important validation was actually from Checkmate 025, which was a randomized trial of um, patients' second line uh, kidney cancer, uh, treated patients, denivolumab or everolimus, and indeed the PBRM1 uh, signal was present in the nivolumab arm was not present in the everolimus arm. And that was even more exciting. And then to top it off even further, um, just to bring it back to some unpublished work, this is led by Kevin By, uh, Kevin B, excuse me, who, and this has been submitted, uh, we've started looking at some single cell data of, of metastatic kidney cancer. And indeed, we can actually take all of the tumor cells in our, in our, in our, in our patient cohort and see that they kind of cluster into two sets um, and, and each tumor has cells representing each of, each of these transcriptional programs. So this really is sort of a heterogeneous ball and, and different ratios. But this, this tumor program over here, um, it's kind of neat because um, it has a very distinct uh, set of programs that, that, it, that it represents, including morphogenesis, kidney morphogenesis and angiogenesis. Whereas the one on the right here as, as these various metabolic signatures, metabolic derangement signatures associated with it, um, which is neat. Um, this signature itself actually stratifies patients by response, so the presence of TP1, uh, in a way that's actually better than PBR1 mutation, and oh even God. after adjust, adjusting for um, uh, all sorts of other clinical factors is still significant. Um, and um, is associated not only with PBRM1 mutation status, but also another chromin regulator, KMD5C. Um, so we really think there's some real biology here and there's some really exciting stuff to explore. However, and this is where things get really complicated for immuno-oncology. And this is, by the way, I'm just saying, this is, if you recall, one line of a like 25 entry table of, of different things. Um, we do not think and do not have evidence for this being a proper biomarker. Um, sorry, folks can just mute uh, if you're not a... Um, so I spent all this time talking about this interesting biology we've stumbled on, but is this a biomarker? And the short answer is, is no. Um, there's now been a couple of different studies looking at patients who are being treated with what is now the clinical standard of care, which is combination VEGF and IO frontline. And we actually don't see the signal. Um, I don't know why. 
Um, there's there's a, numerous reasons, different drugs, different combinations, different patients, different everything. But this is sort of speaks to the challenge of taking biological observations and trying to throw them over the fence into being proper biomarkers, which comes back to the bigger precision oncology challenge uh, that we have to figure out as a, as a group and try to make those, those distinctions clear. In fact, we were so paranoid about this, given my experiences with sort of the way TMB went down, so to speak, that we've made very clear and careful. We don't even use the word biomarker in, in our studies because I'm afraid of that overinterpretation, uh, which even if they try, people won't listen, but that's okay. So um, where do we go from here in this domain? Well, one thing we can do is try to get bigger data sets and actually ask this question, not just in kidney cancer per se, but really across diseases. Um, and so we actually tried that as well. And um, this was led by Diana and Claire that you've heard about and also Natalie Vokes, a former med in my lab is now independent faculty at MD Anderson, um, where we ag aggregated a bunch of patients, whole exomes. Uh, at the time it seemed like big data, although I know my friend Charlie Swan just published a similar kind of work where they got up to like a thousand patients. So I, you know, this is good, but I think actually the themes are the same, right? And so when you organize all this data, there's a lot of stuff I can go through, but I just actually, we're just gonna zoom in on one figure to again, further emphasize wh why this is hard. Um, so this is the copy number analysis of that, of that data set. Um, here we actually, you know, just to orient you, this is focal amplifications or deletions and associations with response or resistance. Um, in our case, we stratify by resist response criteria just to really get at the, the phenotype we think matters. Um, and uh, the first thing you should note is actually nothing achieved even nominal statistical significance. I don't think that's changed, even, even as we've gotten to a thousand patients, that, that hasn't changed. Um, we're still woefully underpowered. Um, that being said, there's still signal to find on the biology perspective. And so for example, um, there's our friend CDK4 uh, again, the cell cycle. And actually, I remember this because we saw this result in our data and got really excited. And like the next day, all these nature papers came out, uh, basically pointing that we're like, oh man, like, oh, we, you know, so it's okay to get scooped, but like, man, we got like really scooped on that one, um, which is fine. Um, but just it's to say that there's a real, some real signal here, but it gets really confusing when you start to consider not just first order events, not just singleton mutations or singleton amplifications, but rather some of these things, these are other features. And I'll explain it, uh, why, um, because we also saw P10, loss of function mutations, also again, tracking with resistance, just like we had seen in that N of one acquired resistance setting, we were now seeing in patients pre-treatment at single time points, loss of function mutations and resistance to immunotherapy. This was consistent with uh, preclinical work from a group at MD Anderson at the time uh, who had found this in melanoma models. And again, here's our, the figure from our, our pre and post therapy uh, resistant patient, again, P10. So if that were the case, you'd also, you, you'd expect then that if P10 loss confers resistance, probably the case that PIK3CA activating mutations also confer resistance. You'd think the downstream signaling implications should be the same or similar. But when we looked at that, it actually was a bit mixed. And so here's our PIK3CA data, our, our hotspot mutations, our putative actionable mutations that are doing the, having the same functional effect stratified by um, uh, histology. And we actually found that some of the mutations were in patients who responded. Um, which is the complete opposite of what we might've expected. And we think the reason why is actually nothing to do with PIK3CA, but more that those PIK3CA hotspot mutations were actually arising from a global apobec mediated mutagenesis uh, signature in those tumors. And it is not entirely clear whether these PIK3CA hotspots were actually functional, but rather might've been passenger hotspot mutations that arose as a result of a, a mutational signature, but were not actually functionally doing anything. Um, and indeed, when you looked at the proportion of mutations from apobec mutagenesis, that actually itself stratified responders and non-responders, at least in bladder and uh, head and neck cancers. And of course, the apobec mutagenesis was also correlated with higher mutational burden, which is to say that everything was sort of confounded with everything else. And we're really in, in the early days of taking some of these biological observations in immune checkpoint blockade um, settings and trying to make biomarkers out of them. Um, as part of this a study, we did a power simulation to really shoot ourselves in the foot for any future um, grant applications, um, where we basically demonstrated that we need thousands of patients to find single gene correlations um, in, in non-homogeneous patient populations. 
And more recently, just to make it even more complicated, uh, we actually started looking at so some of these more so second order events by subtype. So for example, this was led by Jake Conway, as we reported a couple months ago, uh, in about a thousand melanomas where we can split by BRAF, NRAS, NF1, or triple wild type status. Um, and you find that look for the significantly mutated genes. And then actually there were co-mutation patterns that were unique to subtypes. So for example, the NRAS mutant melanoma subtype that were preferentially enriched for loss of function mutations in PBAF genes, you know, ERID2, PBRM1, and others. And those, gene, those mutations tended to be clonal, and those co-mutation patterns tended to be drive a, the majority of the signal of response to immunotherapy in this data set, so in these 300-something melanomas, which means you can't consider single gene mutations in isolation. We need to consider them in tandem with other co-occurring events. Um, if, if we, you know, to, to actually make sense of this. And then we need to turn these things into models. And this is probably the most cynical slide I've made uh, of late, uh, um, because here uh, from a study that was led by David Liu, who I mentioned earlier, we looked at melanoma patients where we had not just the omics, but we had extremely detailed phenotypic information. And we could actually go from not just doing biological sort of, you know, associations studies to, clinical predictive model. And we had two subsets of data. We had patients who had been pre-treated with ipilimumab and so those who were naive. And the two models we made were as follows. Um, this was the model for the pre-treated cohort and this was the model for the naive cohort. And I just wanna call your attention to the pre-treated model. And I won't go into details, but all I wanna say is that the best performing model with the best test characteristics require, uh, given, you know, whole exome sequencing, whole transcriptome sequencing, just tons of omics. The best performing model needed three things. Um, IHC for MHC class two, uh, presence or absence of lymph node metastases from the medical record and serum LDH. So in total, this is probably a predictive model that costs about a dollar um, and outperformed exomes and genomes and whatever omics, which again, sort of really emphasizes focusing in on you know, what are you trying to do? Are you trying to do biology, biological investigation? Or are you trying to make predictive models? If you're trying to do the latter, sometimes you know, some simple and easy to access information is gonna be a lot better uh, than, what, uh, than, than all of the fancy omics that we're trying to use in this domain. So we got a lot of work to do here. Um, so just to try to tie, tie this together, um, what are we doing in clinical computational oncology? We're starting with one patient at one point in time. Um, we're following patients over time, and we're organizing larger and larger sets of data from patients to split in different ways to ask questions with the ultimate end goal of trying to feed back into that one patient at one point in time. Um, and so I, I, hope I've, I hope I've sort of articulated this um, in a way that, that is, is exciting um, and also emphasizing that we have a long way to go. And I'll just end by saying there's two ways we're trying to really build out more sort of opportunities here. One, so I would say locally at Dana-Farber is um, through something, the rebranded Center for Cancer Genomics, uh, we're trying to basically capture biopsies from patients at multiple time points and do not just um, bulk sequencing, but also single cell profiling, model generation, liquid biopsies and whatnot, and really put together a, a sort of a very large effort and a deep dives um, um, to, to get at some of the stuff I'm, I'm, we're trying to get, I was trying to describe today. Um, and that works um, for one, for like sort of in small sort of institution specific ways. But the other way that I actually think is much more interesting is to really kind of flip the whole paradigm on its head and say, rather than having expectation that patients have to come to us to participate in research, perhaps we can bring the research to the patient wherever they are. And so here is the, is I'll present something called the Metastatic Prostate Cancer Project or mpcproject.org. And the idea is, is that one simply goes to this website. If you have advanced prostate cancer, you click the count me in button. Um, and then, um, you know, a few very simple things happen. Um, you fill out a very simple online consent form. Uh, that gives us permission to send you a saliva kit, um, to send you a liquid biopsy kit uh, that we can get your medical records and we can get your archival specimens. Um, and then, you know, you can spit in the tube and send it back to us. You can go for your, let's say your next PSA test, um, give them get, you know, at the Quest Labs or wherever this, this extra thing with instructions, they put, they draw an extra vial, they send it back to us um, and, and follow along. Um, and what's kind of neat is, is that we've now gotten about a, a little over a thousand men who've signed up. 
Um, we are, I believe we're out Wyoming or maybe one of the Dakotas. This, this map's a little out of date. We're like 49 of 50 states. Um, so we're still, still uh, not quite there yet, but we're getting there. Um, we've deposited all our data. We're trying to basically make this, all this data as quickly as we can possibly keep up with it available to the entire community in real time uh, with no questions asked, both in the CBIO portal and the GDC. So all the um, you know, raw data and whatnot. Uh, we're actually getting our first wave of second liquid biopsy kits back from patients that we had the initial kit sent. So we can actually sample patients longitudinally um, in, in real settings. We now know that 75% of the hospitals um, that are represented by our patients are community centers. They're not academic medical centers. And we know that we're not capturing the same patients we usually capture. And um, patients are telling us all sorts of fun things about themselves. Uh, lots of patient reported data most of which I don't have time to go into, but again, to sort of tie this to what I was talking about earlier with immunotherapy, um, you know, patients are getting off-label <laughs> checkpoint blockade, um, and we have a chance to study them um, because they're getting it in the community, and they're telling us about it, and we can now ask these questions. Um, so with that, uh, sorry, I guess I'm just about out of time. Uh, thanks for listening. Uh, thanks again for the invitation. Uh, I'll give a shout out to the whole lab, all of our friends and family. A special shout out to Justin, who's now um, with you guys, who's, who's an extraordinary faculty member, brilliant guy, really wonderful to work with. Um, and uh, lastly, shamelessly promote my Twitter account one more time. Um, happy to take any questions now or in the future. Sorry if there were AV issues earlier. And um, uh, thanks again for the invitation. That's wonderful, Ali. Thank you very much. That was stimulating and we'll open it up for questions now. So if anybody has one, please just unmute and speak up. And while people are kind of collecting their thoughts, I'll ask the, the first one and it pertains to the platinum chemotherapy mutagenesis signature that you identified in your bladder cancer specimens. Did that signature occur equivalently across all patients, regardless of whether they responded to therapy or not? So yeah, it's a good question. So the only way we found this was in, th these were the tumors that um, uh, implicitly didn't respond because in, 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 in that clinical setting, it's, it's, you know, it's kind of, uh, unless they have a complete response, which happens in about 25%, it's, it's hard to determine the degree of response because they're comparing like a TURBT biopsy with like a, a resected cystectomy sample. Um, so these are all pre putatively resistant tumors. Um, you know, we and others have now seen that this can happen, um, you know, irrespective of response, because it's just basically sort of a blanket mutagenesis thing. And we're starting to sort of see some signal that it's possible that even if you get chemotherapy for tumor type A, like you might 10 years later get another cancer um, and you will see the signature in tumor type B that's otherwise like clonally unrelated because, you know, it's basically we've just put a bunch of poison um, and exposed your whole body to it. What it means, I think, you know, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> it's yeah. really neat, uh, but I, I'm not. I'm not sure. We, I'm not sure we can pinpoint. I do think you know. It probably means some of these secondary cancers might have, um, like, there might. It's very possible that some mutations arise from this mutagenesis process that might actually be oncogenic, and those and that sort of as a almost like an explanation for secondary malignancies. But that's uh, getting a little ahead of myself. Um, uh, that's still speculative. Um, Thank yeah. you. Hey, Ellie and Scott. So my name is Andy Nelson. It's nice to meet you, Ellie. Thank you for your talk. Uh, I'm actually one of the molecular pathologists here. So, you know, I, I help run our molecular diagnostics lab on the clinical side and then also do um, kind of both basic mechanistic as well as uh, translational genomic research in breast uh, and GYN malignancies, ovarian awesome. and endometrial malignancies. So uh, unfortunately, I was working with Scott. I actually have to give a talk to the residents after this, which is going to be on a lot of what you talk. So thank you. I hope oh. all the residents <laughs> were listening because you explained it in a much more interesting and fun oh. way with <laughs> data from your lab rather than me just reviewing a bunch of papers. So oh. thank you for that. But unfortunately, I'm, I'm not going to get a chance to, to meet with you a little bit later, but I would love to try and set yeah, something up down the, line, down the road to, to talk about. Um, because one of the things that I wanted to get to, uh, two quick stories, I'm probably going to take up some time here. So I apologize to everybody else. But um, so Dana-Farber is part of something called the Goal Consortium. It's the Genomics Organization for Academic Laboratories. This is a very organic, um, uh, basically clinical, comprehensive genomic profiling assay that is being brought up under the leadership of Jeremy Siegel at University of Chicago and Dara Eisner at University of Colorado. Oh, yeah. Yeah, great. Okay, so so one of the things that I'm going to be on for that uh, for that consortia is actually a, a variant curation. Um, yeah. 
committee as as all of us start implementing this in, in clinical practice. And I'm thinking, you know, one of the things I'd like to talk to you about is I think that some of your ideas about prospective clinical trials or observations in the context of the molecular almanac might fit yeah. in well. So mm-hmm. I would I it sounds like you've heard of it. Have you chatted with them or any of your only- colleagues? That, oh, that sounds vaguely. I mean, there's uh, this. Yeah, that one in particular, I have to recall because there's. I think it's related to one that I think. I think it's. I think I know about it in a different name or a different way. I know. I think I vaguely know about it. But yes, we'd be okay. very happy to share. We try to make you know everything open source, and we're good friends with some of the like the curator teams at like MSK and WashU and other places where people are doing a lot of this. Awesome. Uh, and, and again, and that part of our motivation was not to reinvent those wheels because they done really nicely with that, but rather to sort of inject some of the other content that we thought might be fun to throw into these things. Exactly. I mean, one of our big theories is the more that we can get this interoperable between all the major cancer centers across the nation, the better we're all going to be. So, so then this, the second one is just going to be a fun question that actually, or, or just a vignette actually, that'll go into how I'll teach the residents next to you, but PBRM1 just actually came up the first time um, in some of our molecular tumor boards, it's quite interesting. And I was diving into your data and some of the other data and yeah. renal cell carcinoma on it. But just to kind of, you know, further demonstrate the complexity. So Keras, a lot of our molecular tumor board uh, cases actually come from outside in, uh, outside laboratories, yeah. uh, not necessarily in-house testing. And Keras took a PBRM1 um, missense variant, no, yeah. no data on it whatsoever as to what its functional consequence of it was and called it likely pathogenic and cited some of those studies yeah. that were presenting <laughs> about, about how that could, because it was, this is a, this was a challenging case. It was a cutaneous yeah. uh, infiltrative carcinoma, most likely a morpheiform basal cell carcinoma. And, and it had a high TMB of 30. Yeah. And so the, the question, and, and it's yeah. basal cells, so it has a PTCH1 mutation. Yeah. So the discussion was, do we give hedgehog inhibitors? Do we give Pembro? Or, yeah. or a checkpoint inhibitor, and and it came up, and then it came up that well, there's a PBRM1 likely pathogenic yeah. mutation. Yeah. So I mean, it, it just it, it's an yeah. it's amazing how nuanced it is. So yeah, you know, again, and I think so on that point. So I thank you for saying that, and I think we you know, we've tried our best to be clear where it is and where it isn't. And I think I also think you know there's some you know there's some folks who, depending on how one defines the biology sort of invokes the questions, right? So we were pretty, we tried to be very clear on our entry criteria because there's a lot of biochemical molecular biology data about different mutations in that gene in different regions, just like everything else in biology is complicated. Like, and they work different ways and you can't just sort of bucket it one. And two, um, even then, you know, what we see in data set context A, even within a tumor type doesn't mean it applies to any other context. And the part that like really, I think where I started to get worried about all this, as I was on the bus going to work a few years ago and I I was like, you know, wasting time on Twitter on the bus. And I saw an ad from an unnamed commercial NGS vendor that I won't name, basically saying, our assay will report TMB and solve your immunotherapy problems or something like that. And I was like, and, there's, and then, like, as I said, like, they said, like, my 2015 paper, they're like, well, no, 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 like, no, well, that's wrong. Like, don't do that, you know, uh, and, um, and, and, and that's obviously, as, as we know, snowballed into this insane situation that we all find ourselves in. So, you know, it's a little disappointing to know, <laughs> although not surprising, it's a little disappointing to know that, like, these mistakes keep happening. And no matter what I say, in fact, like, I now put, like, all caps, like, not a, cl- like, in, like, the tutorials yeah. about these things, like, not a biomarker. Nobody listens to me. Uh, <laughs> it, so, but, it, but, but I'm glad you're thinking about it, because that's actually, like, um, it's critical. It's critical. Yeah, it, um, it's a great so. learning point. And I mean, I keep harping on this to all of our oncologists, and it's really nice to talk to an oncologist that gets this, which is, is like, like molecular is inherently local. It has to be put into the context. You can't send it out to a commercial reference lab that just has the answer for every patient. Yeah. And it's, so it, music yeah. to my ears. And I mean, I, I think these types of consortiums that will, will put all of that complex information in one place and make it interoperable and make it accessible or, is fantastic. I, I mean, that's, that's fantastic. That's certainly something we need as a people. Yeah. So, thank, thank you so much. Appreciate yeah, it. Of course. I'll reach out to you through Scott to try and set yeah, something yeah, of course. later next week. Of course. Amy, do we have time for any more questions? Yeah, if you'd like, go ahead. Okay, just unmute if you've got one, please. And if not, I'll, I will ask the final one and it will be pertain to the PBRM1 uh, loss of function. 
And can you speculate about how that may be related to response to checkpoint immunotherapy? So are we losing the, the PBAF complexes at a non-functional switch sniff chromatin remodeling complex in that context and do others take over and drive these inappropriate gene expression responses? So, so the short answer is, is I, I don't know. Um, I think, you know, Kai's group had a mechanism around, um, uh, you know, interferon signaling um, in their melanoma model. Uh, in, in their in their paper that was published with ours, um, I, I have a I have an unsubstantiated hunch that the it's actually the relationship around this and really probably other chromatin regulators that because it's not the only one that's come up as like a chromatin mutant that uh, in a setting of immune therapy response. I think the actually relation is to um, sort of viral mimicry and Dodgers retrovirus sort of uh, accidental uh, exposure, you know, RNA sensing that kind of stuff. Um, I, I, that's my hunch. Um, but you know, we don't know, like in our single cell data, you know, we, we actually, it's kind of almost rediscovered that observation in these, in these single cell programs, which represent a few different things, angiogenesis, morphogenesis and whatnot. Um, we thought for a minute that there actually might be a relationship with ERVs, um, that but we couldn't, we basically need to build a new method to find ERVs in single cell data. So we didn't, couldn't take it all the way for that, that analysis, but something we're very interested in trying to explore. And I think, and you know, from that and from David Barbie's work that I cited, um, um, this, like they had that 2018 study on ERV programs in, um, in cancer cell lines. I've, I just, there's a lot of smoke around that as, as, as a mechanism, but, and, but basically then saying, how does, Chromatin and dysregulation result in ERV exposure. And it, however it works, I don't know. And then does it happen the same way in any given tumor? Probably not. Um, and therefore it's gonna be some heterogeneous sort of um, heterogeneity of sort of the biology there is, 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 is the honest answer, uh, which is a very long winded way of saying, I don't know. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's fascinating, <laughs> fascinating topic for sure. Well, thank you very much. Please join me in uh, thanking Ellie for, for a wonderful talk and look forward to the following your work as, as you continue to make great advances. Thank you very much. Yeah, thanks so much for having me.